Joining me today is a fellow therapist, educator, and author of Truly International Repute. Uh, Whitney Lowe has been in the industry quite a long time. Uh, I've certainly been aware of him. I was digging through old issues of the Bodywork uh, and Movement Therapies magazine, and I see this is from October 1990. And Whitney Lowe is listed on the, the board back then. So Whitney has been in the industry and a, an influencer in the industry for a very long time. He is the author of Orthopedic Assessment in Massage Therapy, which is probably still the most widely used textbook in the massage industry. And I think Whitney is rightly credited with really bringing orthopedic assessment into the massage world for the vast majority of therapists. His textbooks have been incredibly influential. They're on a lot of uh, schools' syllabus as recommended reading. Uh, I'd highly recommend them as well. Really well put together textbooks. But in more recent years, uh, Whitney has been a real pioneer for online learning. And he's really worked a lot on the quality of online delivery, which is incredibly topical at the moment because now that so many people are trying to study from home, the work that he has put in is, again, influencing the industry in a very broad way. Um, he's a regular contributor to quite a few different publications. He contributes to the Journal of Bodywork and Movement Therapies that we just mentioned, going all the way back to 99, uh, Massage and Bodywork, Massage Today, and Massage Magazine. He's also been the recipient of quite a number of prestigious awards. You can find a whole list of these on his website, the Academy of Clinical Massage. But just a couple of high points, he was Educator of the Year in 2013 and 2014 and received a humanitarian award from the Massage Therapy Foundation in 2015. So a truly accomplished educator. And I'd like to welcome Whitney to our show today. How are we doing, Whitney? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, great to talk to you here today. Great. As we were saying that, uh, the two of us have been aware of each other's work. I've certainly, as I said, been reading your books for years. Uh, it's really amazing. We were due to actually be at Eric Dalton's conference in yep. Oklahoma. That would have been the first time that we had actually crossed paths in person. So it's nice to have this uh, opportunity to meet because yeah. I think you're going to be there in September now. That's the plan if it, if it goes. I mean, everything I think is still really up in the air right now, especially with the way things are uh, here in the state. So uh, right now we're going to keep our fingers crossed that we'll be able to do that uh, in early September. Excellent, because that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, as I said, we're really looking at some of the positivity, some of the things that people can be doing, some of the things that therapists in particular can focus on at these difficult times. We do want to acknowledge that people have a lot of difficulties and a lot of stresses at the moment. But in any situation, you can either focus on those stresses or you can focus on some of the positive aspects uh, to help improve mood and help with mental health and issues like that. And I suppose to start off, I wanted to ask you, Whitney, uh, what challenges are you dealing with at the moment and how are you facing those challenges? You know, I would say I'm probably facing a lot of the same challenges that uh, other people are. The challenges are, are uh, economic, for example, um, in that, you know, lots of people had to immediately stop their practice and money became tight all around. And that means one of the early things to drop off is um, additional education things. So, um, you know, we saw the big drop in, in our uh, enrollments for online courses and the other things that we were doing with educational events. And of course, I had a number of live events that were canceled also. So, uh, yeah, we've seen a lot of those kinds of things. But also, I'd say, you know, just psychologically, some of the same kinds of things that everybody else is going through, just like, how long is this going to go on? What's this going to mean for the other side of this? How is the whole world of manual therapy and massage going to change at the end of this? So um, those are all uh, challenges that I think you know we're, we're all sharing. Um, I, there's been a common phrase going around. I've heard lots of people say this, uh, that uh, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And there's a lot of truth to that, I think, in that uh, uh, I would say I, I certainly feel uh, fortunate compared to a lot of what other people are going through. Uh, my business was oriented around online education for many years before this ever came around. So um, a lot of those kinds of things were already in place for me. So it hasn't been the same kind of um, emergency remote teaching that lots of other people have had to do. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, there are similar challenges and, and things that I see lots of other practitioners do not. I try to sort of count my blessings on a day-to-day -day basis, but also it's, it's fair to acknowledge when you're having, you know, rough times also and like um, psychologically or just, you know, mentally, I have to turn the news off sometimes and just sort of like tune some things out because it can get uh, feeling quite overwhelming, I think. Yeah, I saw a, a very interesting podcast that you did with Ruth Warner and you were talking about, you know, helping other educators get online quickly. And I thought it was really yeah. good advice about, you know, get started, you'll learn on the way, here's some important tips, but don't worry about getting it perfect. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, a big distinction. We, uh, you know, I've, I've been talking to lots of people about this right now. There's a big distinction between um, creating online education and emergency remote teaching. And the latter is what most people are really dealing with right now, which is emergency remote teaching. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. And some of them are very relatively low tech, but uh, online education to, to a large extent has had kind of a bad rap in our field for a long time. And just rushing to throw yourself into that world uh, all of a sudden and try to you know paddle and, and catch up to things and put everything online is not the best way to create good uh, online education either. So uh, there's a lot of challenges that people are facing with, with this uh, current situation and trying to find out how to teach and how to continue doing the things that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just, when you talk about, you know, changes in situation, I was looking at my calendar and tomorrow I should have been flying from Brisbane to Adelaide in Australia. Um, oh, yeah. So things have changed and changed very rapidly for all of us. And as you said, there's a lot of uncertainty. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on just kind of week to week over the, the most recent couple of weeks? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. We uh, had designated in our business this uh, whole first half of the year was to be devoted to, we're doing a complete overhaul of our online programs, which we do every roughly four to five years, um, updating technology, updating new uh, content, updating new presentation methods, things like that, new pieces that we want to tweak on some of the, the course content. So that had already been on the calendar for this time period. And it was going to be a very intensive project to redo all those things. And at the, uh, in around early January, uh, we made another decision. This is something that you probably aren't aware of yet since you were mentioning some things about my assessment book. Um, we had decided we are no longer going to print the assessment book. Um, it was in need of revision, and we had been planning to do a book revision. Um, and we decided that what we really wanted to do with that was we wanted to turn it into an online course as well because there's so much about teaching assessment that's done better through an interactive process as opposed to just reading text uh, out of a book. So that project had also been on the burners for this time period. So we were just sort of super slammed with trying to accelerate through these different uh, uh, projects here. And they've, you know, it's been, it's been very, very challenging trying to get this stuff done. So, you know, I watch all these other people on uh, social media and everything talking about uh, trying to find what to do. They're sitting around their house, they're bored during quarantine. And, you know, I'm working like 12 and 14 hours a day uh, on this project um, because that's what we had already planned to be doing. So um, it, it's been an interesting uh, time trying to accelerate through that process, but also continue to do really good, good things with it. So that's been keeping me very busy during the quarantine period here. Yeah, I think that's the difference nearly between what uh, some of the educators are doing compared to maybe what a lot of therapists are doing, that yeah. all the educators I've talked to, and I found the same thing myself, is that we've actually been incredibly busy, partly because of the uncertainty that you're trying to get a project finished in a window yeah. that you don't know how long it's going to be. So yeah. we're really rushing to do that. But again, one of the positives, I think, is the quality of online learning that's being made available, the access to really high-level educators that therapists might not have had before. And I think particularly within our industry, there's a certain amount of, you know, I suppose the kinesthetic learner is sometimes a little bit of a technophobe. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. one of the positives is it has encouraged people to seek out online education. It's yeah. got better recognition for online education from state boards and things like that. Um, so I think there's actually quite a, a technological and an accessibility leap forward that's happened as a result of the pandemic. I yeah. don't know, would you I think that? I think so too. And, and, you know, it's allowed people to kind of look at different facets of what they're trying to do to move their education forward. So for example, in our online courses, we emphasize that they're really not so much about learning new techniques and new things to do with your hands as much as they are teaching you more about clinical reasoning and problem solving and assessment strategies and the sort of the, a lot of the rehabilitation science that comes into your practice. A lot of the things that are really decision-making processes, you know, what is this particular complaint that I'm dealing with? You know, how, what's the best treatment approach to do? Those aren't things you do with your hands. They're actually decisions. And um, so a lot of our, our online education focus has been on teaching creative problem solving skills and clinical reasoning processes and things like that. And it's, it's not easy, uh, but it really helps move people forward in, in a different type of way than, than what the hands-on skills do. And there's you know, obviously need for both of those types of things. But I also wanted to call attention to something you mentioned a moment ago, which is that um, 
I really want to give kudos and give credit out there to a lot of the educators um, across the field who I've seen doing some really innovative things uh, right now because they were forced into very rapid innovation very quick, very quickly without any preparation to that. And I've seen some really interesting things that people are doing without really having much training or exposure to how to deliver things online. So um, I really give credit to a lot of the educators out there that are doing some, some fascinating and innovative types of things. Yeah, I think it's actually been a, a very creative time all around, like creative for educators uh, being challenged to adopt new technologies, as you say. I've even seen a lot of therapists posting things that they're doing, you know, where they've taken up maybe painting or, you know, things yeah. that are, are unrelated, but, you know, just creative. I think it is sure. actually a very yeah. creative time. Yeah. And, you know, lots of things like remote connecting with their clients. I've talked to a lot of people who are doing um, simple uh, Zoom sessions of self-massage with their clients, you know, teaching them how to do things uh, in their home and, you know, just a way to stay connected with them. So uh, it really has been a period of, of uh, flourishing some, some creative and inspiring ideas that we see. So hopefully we can hang on to some of that stuff and use that creativity when we come out of this on the other side too. I'm really yeah. looking forward to seeing what you do with the, the textbook going online because I think that really is, I think you've hit the hit nail on the head for starters about the clinical reasoning. It's something that I've been aware of over the last few years that I think a lot of us in our early years of practice, we become kind of technique junkie, junkies and we mm -hmm. study and yeah. study, study, which is really good. You know, I'm yeah. not just saying that as an educator, I think it's really beneficial, but yeah. you really do get to that stage where you go, what really makes the difference in successful treatment outcomes in helping your client out of pain is good clinical reasoning skills. And yeah. I think it's something that a lot of therapists come to at a certain point in their development, at a certain point in their understanding and their practice. And I think it's something that is an underrated and overlooked skill in a lot of cases. And a textbook, it's very hard to get that across. The, the digital medium is, gives you yeah. so much more scope. So yeah. I'm really excited to see what you, where you go with that. I, I don't know, can you talk any more about that or is it still? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, historically, just to give some context too, um, I got into online education back in the, uh, actually in the late 90s and early 2000s. So it's been a long time. Wow. Um, and I got into that for this very reason, which is I was having a lot of difficulty um, with what I felt was trying to teach complex clinical reasoning skills in the typical two-day weekend workshop format, which is the sort of format that we do a lot of our, our continuing education courses in. And, you know, I'd, I'd go over a topic, go over a concept, and then uh, give the students an activity to apply that in a different context with some kind of reasoning applications applied. And I would get people looking at me with this deer in the headlights look like, you know, they just, they don't know what to do because I didn't tell them what to do. And that's so when I realized that, you know, the way our whole educational system is set up is really more about, um, let me show you this or let me tell you this and then you do it. Uh, and teaching the reasoning process and the clinical reasoning process is really a lot more challenging. It needs a lot of trial and error. Uh, it needs for people to make uh, errors and see, you know, why they were wrong here, why they were correct here and go this path, go down that path. And that just isn't really feasible in the classroom because of the logistics, which is it's one pace fits all. Basically it's the instructor's pace of what you're doing, moving through the content in the classroom. And you can't have people kind of making these different, um, ventures into different places very easily. And so I started looking into online education as a means for doing that and explored a lot of facets of uh, instructional design and you know, looked at what they were doing in some of the medical schools and some of the other places that were trying to do the same thing, which is you know, teaching more complex reasoning processes through online education and learned a lot about things that are very helpful in that process. You know, like um, your typical online course, for example, when you, you know, have information that's presented to you in a video or in text or something like that, and then you take a quiz uh, on this to test your knowledge of those concepts, you often get feedback on the quiz. You got this question right and this question wrong, and that's where it ends. That's not the best way to really get a good learning experience out of that. A much yeah. more effective way is what's called formative feedback, which is if you get a question wrong, then immediately, because the time matters, of while this is still fresh in your mind, feedback pops up why this question is incorrect. And that takes a lot of time to build out that kind of thing, but it really is a much better learning experience for people in terms of reinforcing their understanding of why they're doing the things that they're doing and why they make the decisions that they make. Yeah, I've seen that in some really, what I would consider to be high quality uh, digital texts recently, yeah. uh, where they, the, the creators have clearly gone to that uh, background work 
that it really, as you said before in your previous talk, that it kind of front loads a lot of the work onto the educator, yeah. mm -hmm. but the payoff is huge for the student learning experience. Yeah, it really is. And if you can, you know, my sort of desire moving forward into the future is to continue even further down that path of personalized learning uh, where you have courses that, for example, if you come in, like, you know, my course, just for example, might have somebody in it who is, uh, you know, six months out of massage school and somebody else with you know, the level of experience like you. And like your educational needs are going to be very different for a course like that. So what if you have different paths that you could pursue? Like you could pursue, uh, you know, an, an earlier stage path or you could pursue a more advanced level stage path and go up to a higher level of stuff through the coursework. And that's um, what really gets me motivated is, is uh, looking down the road at some of these potential developments for more personalized learning experiences that we can deliver for people. I've definitely seen that in recent years where we've started to offer a, uh, a workshop, um, a live clinic before the, the weekend seminar. And the interesting thing is you tend to get the more experienced therapists coming along for those clinic workshops where... Mm -hmm. I think a lot of time people will sign up to a seminar based on, oh, they're going to be covering knee conditions or something, that, something of interest to them. Um, whereas if it's kind of an open workshop, like we, we get people to bring in their own clients and we go through uh -huh, the clinical yeah, reasoning. Uh -huh. Why do you think it's this? So there isn't yeah. an agenda. It's what is the person walking through the door? What is the complaint they have? What do you think that's likely to be? How are you going to go about treating it? And you see so many of these very experienced, brilliant therapists, but they get these aha moments because there isn't a structure. It's like, this is how yeah. it is in clinic. Right. And I've, I've, and I've really seen that. I, I, yeah. I, as an educator, you find that very rewarding as well. Absolutely. You know, and there is, uh, we know this from instructional design theory, there is nothing like an educational experience that mimics what happens in real life to anchor content. Because what has tended to be the process in a lot of educational environments previously is that uh, it's more along the lines of content or information dumping, which is we give people out a lot of information and then assume that they can make the connections there. But when you can make an, a, an educational environment like what you're talking about, where it really mimics the real life clinical situation, that's what really makes, uh, makes it work really well. There's a great book for uh, educators uh, that I always recommend called Make It Stick. Um, and it's about that very thing. How do you make these things really stick to people and not just be something that they remember for a short period of time until the weekend's over or till, you know they have to take their licensure test or whatever it is. But how do you make things that really stick with people and really you know, become beneficial for them over the long run? There's some really great stuff in there and a good you know, consolidation of a lot of the educational research as well. That kind of is one of the questions I was going to ask you. Is there any particularly useful resources you would recommend? So that's a really good tip. That's, that's yeah. excellent. I'll have to look into that. And just in terms of yourself, like how, how have you been finding the, within your region, um, has there been, like are, are, are people reopening yet? Because that's a big concern here in Ireland. People are talking about when do they reopen. It's very different in different jurisdictions. Yeah, it's, it is a, um, it's become a really contentious debate in this country, unfortunately. Uh, uh, there are individuals, there's some people who never stopped working. Um, and there are people who stopped immediately and say, you know, we're not going back for a long time. And I know a lot of people who have closed their clinics because they just said, I can't keep paying the rent on something that I have no idea how long this is going to go on. Um, it's been very difficult, very, very difficult. Um, and, you know, it's, it's made more difficult by some of the, it, you know, it is very, uh, it's very challenging and difficult to separate the political climate in this country from a lot of these kinds of things, and we've seen it really start influencing a lot of this kind of thing, which is really unfortunate, I think, because it would be best if we could make good evidence-based decisions about what is the you know, most important or best things to do in terms of public health, but also recognizing there's economic issues that we have to take into consideration and try to come to some good beneficial compromise here. But uh, yeah, there's people who are starting to open up. We're in uh, many of the states here are in, in some of their early phases of reopening and some of them are in some of the later stages. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of predictions here coming from the uh, the Centers for Disease Control and some of the other models that we're going to be seeing um, spikes return again once we start getting out and, and getting in the public sphere again. So, um, you know, I, I think clinicians are in a very difficult place, having to face some very difficult questions and challenges about, you know, when do I go back and how do I go back? What do I do when I go back? Um, this, this really is a, is a very uh, difficult thing for us.
And I, I think it's an interesting thing. I've talked to a couple of people recently about this, and I'd, I'd always be respectful of the fact that there is a spectrum amongst therapists as there is amongst the general population, that yeah. some therapists are very concerned maybe for their own health, they have underlying conditions, or maybe someone in their immediate family. And then there's other people that, as you say, they have serious financial concerns. And I would be very respectful to both. Um, and I do think that it is kind of an individual choice to a certain extent, obviously within the guidelines of your local government. I think a lot of associations have been very good. I know here in Ireland, I'm, I'm president of the Irish Massage Therapist Association. So uh -huh. we put together and we're putting out a lot of information for folks as well. Some of it very local, a lot of it actually based on stuff coming out of the CDC, like our own health service executive bases, a lot of their they're kind of um, recommendations for hygiene and things like that from CDC yeah. guidelines. So I would say this commonality, you know, we're, we're dealing with the same virus, we're dealing with the same person-to-person uh, -person type issues in each jurisdiction. Uh, yeah. It's just interesting to see how it impacts people in different ways and how they're dealing with it. Yeah. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day too about the clinical environment. What makes this particularly difficult is, you know, we do our work in a very small enclosed space for most people that often has poor air circulation. And, you know, we say that it's important for us to work on methods of hygiene and social distancing in our interactions with everybody. But, uh, you know, in the way that most massage therapy is, is practiced, for example, you talk to your client at the outset, you leave the room while they get undressed. They sneeze, they cough while they're in the room by themselves. You don't have any idea that that's happening. You don't know what to go you know, clean uh, more appropriately. Lots of people have carpet on the floor. You know, how do you clean carpet? You know, yeah. there's just all kinds of really challenging things that we have to grapple with that most people just like wouldn't have had to really, you know, think about it, certainly in that level of detail before this. I know, it's, I think it's going to be a challenge, Ed, that there is going to be much higher levels of cleaning required between clients that, yeah. you know, in terms of the, <laughs> the number of clients that somebody can see in one day, I think that even when people do go back to clinic practice, there's still going to be challenges uh, to be faced. I do think it's going to be kind of a bumpy road, but at the same time, I think there's a lot to look forward to. I wonder if you could talk about maybe things that you have planned for the future. I know you're, you have your regular podcast with Till Luca. We talked to Till uh -huh. about this, The Thinking Practitioner, an excellent yeah. podcast, by the way. Congratulations thank, on that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we have really, a great really time doing myself. that. Yeah, yeah. So. I think I've, I've watched every episode as they come out. So right. do, have you anything yeah. coming up uh, soon that you can talk about? Yeah, we had an interesting discussion the other day, and it, it ran on kind of long. Um, that was about education, uh, which is my, you know, sort of my bailiwick where I really like uh, living, about the fact that massage therapists, um, unlike a lot of other health professionals, basically choose their own curriculum once their entry-level training is over. And a lot of this came up because of the COVID-19 situations and, and some of the stuff that was happening in this country of trying to determine when massage therapists should stop working based on whether or not there was this term that was going around about were they medically necessary. And yeah. so this question was coming up about like, what aspect of massage, is there an aspect of massage that is medically necessary? And, and then again, how do you determine training for that? You know, whose training do they take, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, that was kind of uh, uh, some interesting things. And I think there's another one that's coming out, I believe this, this week that was just about us talking about, you know, why do we, it's kind of like our, our discussion that we're having here today. Why do we keep on in this field? What is it that's going to drive us to keep doing this? Because it's going to be different. And it's going to be harder for a while. So what are some of those key things that will keep us doing the things that we're doing and, and why should we keep doing it? Okay. Definitely a lot to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. I'll be quite excited He's, about uh, some of that. He is just such a wonderful uh, soul, and I have a, a great time talking with him about this. So it's, he's, he, yeah. uh, you know, we do uh, uh, interesting things with the discussions that we have in the podcast, but it's so personally rewarding for me, too. I learned so much from, from my discussions with him. So uh, he's just a great guy. So, so we, we have a good time with that. But one of the things I really like about uh, the attitude that both yourself and Till take on the podcast is a very open, non-critical kind of attitude where you'll discuss things and you'll say, like, I like the idea that, well, there's different narratives, that oftentimes yeah. a lot of what we do doesn't change that much, but our understanding of the rationale behind it might change. Yeah. And so you, mm -hmm. Till in particular was talking, when we worked together, he was over here in Ireland uh, back in November. He's coming back this year as well. We did a joint seminar. And I really liked his approach that it's not, you know, there's my way or this is my yeah. understanding and this is what it is. You mm -hmm. know, I really like the respectful attitude that you guys take. So I would encourage anybody watching this that if you haven't checked out The Thinking Practitioner, do so. You won't be sorry. It's a really good podcast. There's a lot of 
discussion that really feeds into your understanding of what each of these topics are involving, whatever it might be, whether it's education. Uh, I really like the one on the cytokine storm as well. You yeah. guys did one on stretching. You know, there was, yeah. there's just been so many good episodes that you could jump in anywhere. They're kind of, they're pretty self-contained. You know, you yeah. can just literally start on whichever topic interests you. But education yeah. is definitely a big one that interests me too. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I like about our conversations too is that it's, it's very easy for both of us to say, well, I totally disagree with that. And, you know, the other person is like, okay, let's hear that. You know, and so we, we were really good about hearing those uh, other alternative viewpoints and, and sometimes changing our perspective based on what we hear as well too. So, so I, I like That's that good. a lot. Nice and open. Yeah. yeah. And one of the other things um, I was going to mention is we've, again, this has kind of come up recently here in Ireland about um, where does massage therapy fit in, in a kind of a healthcare model in relation to going back to work? And I think part of the problem is when you say massage, it covers such a spectrum. And what's interesting here is that two of the government departments have come out and said that massage therapists could be considered part of their essential services provided you are treating people who have a degenerative condition or a chronic condition that is getting worse because they're not getting treatment or could get worse because they're not getting treatment. So people like ourselves that are very interested in the treatment of chronic pain, you know, the focus is rather than kind of a relaxation model, which I love, yeah. I started off with relaxation therapies, but the treating chronic pain is a different kind of model. And a lot of our clients do rely on us to a certain extent to get them out of a painful episode. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, you, you, what you're really hitting on is something we uh, have talked about a good bit too over in, uh, in this country. We, I often refer to this as kind of a split personality that we have in our field in that, you know, we do uh, have a, a sort of this division of, of practitioners who are working predominantly in sort of the relaxation model and, and the wellness model and those that are working uh, as sort of a, a person who's working in more of a healthcare model dealing with compromised health conditions, be that musculoskeletal pain or, you know, cancer or, or whatever uh, types of uh, more medically oriented things. And it's really awkward for us as a field that we have one training track that's supposed to train us for these two very different divisions. And I think we do a pretty good job of uh, training at the entry level for the sort of wellness massage track and a really poor job of training at the entry level for the sort of healthcare track. And that's why we have so many continuing education courses geared toward that type of thing. And this is kind of what Till and I were talking about the other day in our, in our podcast, which is that people end up then choosing their own curriculum for what they want to learn in those sort of advanced skills, which there's good aspects to that, but there's also detrimental aspects in that you don't always know what you really need to know. <laughs> you don't know what you should be learning. So um, that poses some interesting challenges in trying to define as broadly as massage therapists by some of these, you know, uh, governmental uh, dictates or guidelines that are coming out because we're really not all the same. We're really quite a, a, a variety of different uh, uh, fruits in the basket, so to speak. Yeah, it's very hard to have a level playing field when there's so many options for, as you said, that kind of continuing education and people follow all different routes, all of them valid. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But very hard to then, like you said, level it out and say, well, what is in one basket? What's in another basket? Yeah, that's a big yeah. challenge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was um, a lot of educators at the moment are in response, I suppose, to the recognition that a lot of therapists are you know, going through financial difficulties at the moment with their businesses being closed. You have some really good specials going on at the moment. So this is your website. And I noticed that you have a couple of specials running. I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about those, Whitney? Yeah, so we um, our main online programs are are divided up into seven different body region courses, and we're doing sort of a pretty significant discount on them, and a, a deeper discounts on even some of the bulk packages, the two and three course packages, and the full seven course package. So, we've we started those um, deep discounts right around the time of maybe mid to late March when the COVID nineteen situation started, and. Uh, we're just going to kind of keep them going right now while everything's difficult. Don't have a, uh, necessarily an ending date in there, but we're hoping to encourage people to take some advantage of this time period if they can to uh, you know work on their learning, improve some things so they can go back uh, to practice and do, do things even better. But we also recognize that lots of people are in financial challenge right now and, and money's tight for just putting groceries on the table. So um, absolutely acknowledge that difficulty that everybody else is having to deal with as well. Yeah, that there are, there's a lot of good resources out there. And I think that people who have 
financial reserves, they can access some of these really good uh, opportunities. There's some free resources available out there. We'll provide some links for some of those kinds of things. Um, but I do think it is a really useful tool for preparing going back to work to continue some education while you have the time. Because a lot of people will say, most of the time, uh, I know a lot of therapists say, well, I've got a whole shelf full of books that I haven't got around to reading, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. yeah. Or, you know, I know there's, there's a great online course, but I haven't got time to take it. You know, now kind of is the time. It is one of those positive things you can be doing. Yeah, it is. And I acknowledge, too, that motivation is difficult. Uh, you know, you can see these things out there and say, like, oh, this is a great thing. You know, we've got a lot of people who've purchased online courses and never started them because it's difficult sometimes to get yourself motivated to do this kind of stuff. And you know, quite honestly, I mean, I will admit this, that our courses aren't easy. Um, so there's a lot of things that are more, that are easier to do during the quarantine period than sit down and actually delve in and really do some, some deep work. So uh, it's, uh, motivation is a real challenging factor in online education, especially when you're self dealing with, you know, asynchronous programs that happen at any particular time. And it's up to you to set your time schedule to do those kinds of things. So uh, that is one of the big challenges that, that we, we run into, certainly with those models. But for everybody else that's out there, you know, um, do a balance. I think it's really important. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your physical environment as much as possible. But when you can, try to take some time to invest in yourself and your improvement in the future and things like that. I think those are really uh, beneficial things to help us feel uh, energized and motivated coming out on the other side of everything. That, that's the thing. I think that um, part of looking after your mental health, what a lot of people suggest is structure. And it's something yeah. that a lot of the, the health services here have put out about, you know, structuring your day. And part of that structuring your day might say, well, I'm not going to try and complete an online course, but I'm going to do an hour a day. And then you, you have something that you're working towards, which is motivating in and of itself once you've gotten yeah. started with your, your daily routine. And then yeah. there's the, the reward afterwards, the, the success when you do complete it. Yeah. And in fact, that really is one of the, I mean, this is an interesting thing that educational research has backed this up. This is one of the most beneficial ways to do your education is in smaller chunks repeatedly over time, as opposed to doing it in one massive cramming process. Oh my God, you know, my credits are due for renewal next week. I got to get this thing done. I got five courses I got to do in the next week. That's not going to be good learning. It's going to be gone within, you know, 48 hours after the deadline's over. Uh, we call this chunking in the educational world of you know putting things in small chunks uh, for uh, and spreading those out over time. There's a lot of brain research and neuroscience research that that uh, demonstrates that's a much more effective way for learning to occur. Uh, that's another reason you know why I really like working in the online uh, environment as opposed to the weekend workshop uh, environment because logistically it's as you know doing these things it is really challenging to maintain people's attention and, and for their brains to even take stuff in after several hours, you know, and especially after several days doing things like that. It's just, it is what's referred to as cognitive load. It's, it's excessive, you know, mental overload. Uh, so yeah, little yeah. pieces, like you said, is, is good. good funny. What stuck with me is the graphic you've used in the past is the Ben and Jerry's ice cream. That's right. You know, yeah. the chunks, you got to chunk it. <laughs> that was That's very right. funny. Yeah. Uh, it's a really nice way of, you know, illustrating in a clear way. And yet it looks like a reward as well. Cause it's a nice tub of ice cream. That's right. It's, yeah. My favorite ice cream. I always got to give a, a shout out to, to Chunky Monkey and the New York super fudge chunk uh, ice cream there. <laughs> Very important for all massage therapists. That's um, right. So is there anything you'd like to say to us in closing, Whitney? Uh, I would just like to say thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you and, and to, you know, spread ourselves across the pond here and connect. Uh, I was talking with someone the other day about, uh, you know, this uh, situation, the COVID-19 situation, uh, it has made it, I think, somewhat easier to some degree, the fact that we have all of these connections across the world with everybody else. And we see that we're not in this alone. We're in this with other people. Uh, we're, we're doing different interesting things. We're doing engaging things. Uh, we get ideas from people in different places. Um, you know, I've done a couple of, you know, these types of interview things with people in, in different countries during this period. And it's just been great to connect with people and see, well, what's happening in your world? What's happening in your world? And, and uh, that's a really important balance, I think, to some of the vitriol and the, you know, the arguments that you see on your Facebook groups and some of the other, you know, just the, the angst that we all get ourselves ginned up into through social media. So there's a good side of it too. And this is certainly is, is the good side of, of these kinds of things. So um, thank you again very much for the opportunity to, to have a, a great conversation across 
across the waters about this. Well, you're very welcome, Whitney. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I would like to say that I think that is one of the big positives. I've been involved in a couple of different projects as far reaching as Australia with Dave Sheehan and uh, Myotherapy and Massage MMA over there. And they have put together like a, a program um, where they interview different therapists from around the world. And I think those kind of things of, of people coming together, sharing their stories, cooperating within the industry, sharing information is just really, really useful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and I hope that, you know, maybe some, some of these uh, relationships that get established in this process turn into uh, ones where we, once uh, social distancing is somewhat relaxed, we do get the opportunity to share physical space uh, somewhere along the lines as well. And I will look forward to seeing you down the road, hopefully in, uh, in early September in Oklahoma. Yeah, I think Oklahoma is going to be a lot of fun. So if anybody can make it to Oklahoma, if anybody can make it to Oklahoma uh, for Eric Dalton's seminar in September, uh, it's on the it's the Labor Day weekend in the U.S. Labor Day weekend. That's a yeah Labor a Day uh, holiday yeah. here in the states. So yeah, uh, it's highly recommend Monday that. In, in in September. Yeah, yeah. So Whitney's uh, the guest presenter at that. Eric will be there. I'll be there. There's a whole range of other therapists. Uh, I think James Wozniak is going to be there. A lot of really high caliber educators. So it's a really great way of of experiencing some really great education, provided your travel restrictions have lifted and you're able to uh, yeah. attend. It's definitely something I'd recommend. Uh, I'd also, as I said, I, I really recommend checking out uh, Whitney and Till's podcast, The Thinking Practitioner. It's an excellent podcast. And other than that, Whitney, I'd like to say thanks very much for joining us today. And I look forward to catching up with you in Oklahoma. That sounds good. Thanks again so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.